Hey everyone, welcome to another presentation. In this video, I'm going to be talking about quality of welds. And there's a lot that goes into quality of welds, but I've broken it down to just a few simple topics. First, we're going to take a look at the purpose of weld quality. So why is it that we look for certain things in a weld and why we don't just accept a weld that simply holds two pieces together and that's it? We're going to look at some things that reduce the quality of welds, otherwise known as weld discontinuities. And we're also going to take a look at ultimately who is responsible for the quality of welds. Now, as we start diving deeper into this, every weld basically serves a purpose, whether that's to uh, help to support load bearing capabilities or to support the capability of resisting certain stresses. So think of, think of the frame of a, of a vehicle. A vehicle does a couple different things. You know, you can use a vehicle to tow stuff, to haul stuff. Uh, a lot of people use cars to basically go fast, to commute. Uh, you know, a lot of people do a lot of different things with their vehicles, but these welds hold the frame together so that way whatever stresses or loads you throw at your vehicle, it doesn't just fall apart. Now the same could be said about a bridge. So a bridge is meant to uh, carry a load, but then also withstand stresses. So larger bridges, say the Golden Gate Bridge, it's a very big and very long bridge. And you know that in times when there's uh, really windy weather, this bridge kind of sways a little bit. So all the welds that go into this bridge help to resist uh, certain stresses and then also to um, withstand load bearing uh, operations. So every single time a car drives across that bridge, these welds are holding a lot of that weight. And if a weld were to fail, that could be catastrophic. All right, same thing with uh, building work. Um, let's say naval uh, shipyard work, uh, airplane, uh, air, aerospace welds. You know, every weld holds material together so that way it can handle a load and or resist certain stresses. So this is why a lot of companies are very strict about weld quality. They want to be able to send out parts or assemblies that are, that are going to hold up to the test of time with very little rework in the future. Now, it is inevitable that some welds are going to have to be repaired over time, but that's a whole nother discussion. One thing that I want to point out is that, you know, some people, they have this idea that as long as the weld holds, it doesn't matter how pretty it needs to be. Now, in some cases, that might be true, but depending on uh, what the weld looks like, really, it could mean a number of different things. And the main idea here that I want you to take away is that welds that have a very poor quality are going to fail. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And when they do, it's, you know, depending on what the weld is made on, it's either going to be kind of bad or it's going to be very bad. It, there, there is no positive uh, outlook on this. It's always going to be bad. So whether or not it's something as simple as maybe uh, a weld holding your table together at work or say a weld holding, you know, a very crucial component together on a bridge or maybe even like a, the frame of a skyscraper, you know, um, once one weld fails, the load or basically the stresses are going to be applied to surrounding welds even more so than normal and it's going to create this domino effect once one weld fails the next one is going to fail then the next one and again it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when so every single time an inspector or your supervisor or someone comes up to you and says, hey, we need to ensure the quality of our welds. Basically, what they're also trying to do is ensure structural integrity of whatever part or assembly your company is producing. 
And if you're asking yourself, well, how do I know what good quality is, what bad quality is, you know, who basically makes up the standards for the quality of welds? Well, for, uh, for welders, there are three main organizations that create the standards for uh, weld quality. They are the American Welding Society, otherwise known as the AWS. There is the American Petroleum Institute, otherwise known as API. And there is the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, otherwise known as ASME. Now, AWS has a long list of codes. The most popular one, especially uh, the one that you'll be dealing with in our program, is AWS D1.1, which is known as the Structural Welding Code for Carbon Steel. Now, with ASME, the most popular one you'll be dealing with is Section 9. And I don't have an image here for API, but their code that we deal with mainly is API uh, code 1104. So depending on what type of welding you want to get into uh, for a career, there's going to be a different set of standards that dictate uh, a quality, a high quality acceptable weld versus a poor quality rejectable weld. Oh, and then a couple other things that these standards will talk about they'll list a whole bunch of things in, in reference to various weld applications. Uh, so like I said, basically whatever you want to do, there's probably going to be a code book that has something to say about the work you're going to do. And uh, there's going to be some information in there on how welders are to be certified in order to do that kind of work. Uh, there's going to be a lot of information in there on how to do the work that you want to do. And, uh, yeah, there, there's going to be a lot of information in these codes, but, you know, we'll take a little bit at a time. Um, this will, you'll find out a little bit more in future courses for right now. I just want you to know that these, these standards or these codes are out there and they pretty much tell us what to look for as far as weld quality. Now let's start talking about discontinuities. So when we start talking about the different kind of things that can reduce the quality of a weld, what we're mainly talking about are discontinuities. And you'll hear a lot of different terms here. You'll hear discontinuity. You'll hear some people say defects. You'll hear some people say flaws. These terms are somewhat synonymous. I do want to point out that there is a difference between a discontinuity and a defect. So while a discontinuity can be a defect, not every defect is a discontinuity. Now that may not make sense. That may sound a little confusing. So let me just say this. Everything that we're going to talk about is a discontinuity. But depending on the work that you're doing and the code that you're working to, some discontinuities are acceptable, or at least I should say some level. And we'll get into the different types of discontinuities here in just a little bit. But for right now, I just want you to remember that some discontinuities will become defects if they are past a certain threshold. If there's just a lot of it, or if there's a little bit of it, but it can cause such, um, you know, such a change in the well that it becomes a defect. So some discontinuities are okay, and some are, you know, going to be a cause for rejecting the weld. It depends on the code book. All right, so here is a list of discontinuities. So, uh, if you're in my class, you've heard me talk about this stuff a lot. If you're not in my class, don't worry. This is something that you've probably heard before or you're probably going to hear about. Um, porosity, undercut, incomplete fusion, incomplete penetration, so on and so forth. You, uh, you've you got the list there. You can go ahead and read it. And then I've got a few images here that kind of describe and offer a little bit more information about these discontinuities. 
Uh, you can find these images from Lincoln Electric. These are just a few of them. Obviously, there's more. Okay, and then when we start talking about responsibility of weld quality, so who is responsible for the quality of the weld? Well, the, everyone has a little bit of responsibility in this at the workplace. There are the engineers that are supposed to um, go over what the project is supposed to be, and then from there, design the project itself. So they're the ones that do all the math, all the calculations of metal thicknesses, uh, weld joints, weld positions, what welding process to use, what electrode to use, uh, what amperage or voltage, wire feed speed, all that kind of good stuff that goes into creating the weld. The engineers are the ones who basically think of it and uh, put it on paper. So whenever you're getting a blueprint, the blueprint was created by the engineers. So that's kind of like the first step of quality. Then there are the supervisors. The supervisors, you know, it's, it's kind of inherent in their name. They, they supervise and oversee welding operations and they're supposed to be, you know, making sure that everyone more or less is doing the right job. So if you're doing if you're if you're laying down some really great high quality acceptable welds you know your supervisor is probably not going to say anything to you because you're doing what you need to do but if for some reason let's say the machine's not working right you're off your game that day or something else is wrong and the welds aren't coming out how they're supposed to your supervisor is going to be one step in the quality control process that that will basically step up and say hold on stop the welds aren't coming out how they're supposed to be. We need to do something about it. And, you know, you'll, you'll go from there. And then obviously there are us, the welders. We, as we create these welds, we need to know what to look for and um, basically what's going on with our weld so that way we can prevent our welds from being rejected. And then there are the inspectors. The inspectors are kind of like the last line of defense so after the welds have been created and sometimes during welding operations the inspectors will come look at the welds they'll check everything out they'll make sure everything is good to go and they're pretty much the last ones to sign off uh, saying that these welds are acceptable or they'll say that the welds are rejected and then they have to be grinded out or they have to be fixed you know fixed some way um, and so there's a little bit of responsibility at each level. I want to say that ultimately, we as the welders, we are the ones responsible. But there are different steps in this whole line of quality control. And so I was talking previously about how the engineers uh, create these designs. Pretty soon, we're going to start talking about what are called uh, procedure qualification records, or basically records of procedure qualifications. So every time an engineer goes to create a blueprint, and again, we go back to these codes, depending on what kind of work you're doing, um, the code book is going to have some information on how to uh, do the job. Now, there are what are called pre-qualified pre procedures. So these are various types of jobs that are listed in the codebook that have already been deemed uh, pre-qualified. And basically what that means is if you do the work that's laid out in the codebook according to these pre-qualified procedures, then it's already more or less guaranteed to work. It, well, I shouldn't say guaranteed. It's been shown that it can work. It's been proven that if you follow the directions in the code book, the welds will hold up. Um, now, if there's nothing like that in the code book, but you are welding to a certain code, then your job has to do, uh, has to go through the process of qualifying the procedure. And um, I'll get into that 
in a little bit in another presentation. I don't want to get too far into it, but just know that if your work is doing any kind of code work, code work, if it's already included in the code, you're good to go. If it's not included in the code, then there's some more work that your company needs to do. Not necessarily you, but your company. Then of course, with every single procedure, welders, if you're doing the work to a certain code, you have to be certified to do that work. So you have to go through the test to prove that you can weld this certain assembly. They're gonna test your welds, and if you pass, then you are now certified and qualified to do the work. Now, some people will say that it's on the employer to maintain records of certification. And while that is true, you should always look after yourself and try to keep a copy of your certification. That's gonna be one thing that inspectors look for. Whoever's doing the work, your company needs to have uh, your certification records to actually prove that you're qualified to do that work. Because if an inspector comes down, finds out that some welders are doing certain code work but are not certified, all of those welds are automatically a no-go, okay? So there's just a whole lot that goes into the quality of welds. But again, we're just keeping it kind of basic for now. And this is all stuff that I had mentioned already. Engineers design the weldments. Supervisors, they oversee welding operations. Welders, we're the ones doing the work, and then the inspectors are like the last line of defense. So there's, again, a lot that goes into weld quality. There are reasons why we, we harp on making sure that our welds are of the best quality. Discontinuities are going to happen. Sometimes we'll have undercut. Sometimes we'll have a little porosity. Sometimes we might have a little bit of excess uh, reinforcement. Things are going to happen. It, it's inevitable. And depending on what welding code we're working to, some discontinuities are going to be okay. But if there's too much, uh, say there's too many uh, occurrences in the weld of, say, porosity, or you just have too much undercut, um, it's going to be up to the code and the inspector to determine whether or not it passes or it's rejected, and then you have to fix the weld. So this might have been a whole lot of information. I tried to keep it just to the basics. Uh, so if you have any questions, any concerns, please feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.